Well, hi, everybody. Today I'm interviewing Heidi Herman. Retired, Heidi is retired from telecommunications and started writing children's books after her mother published a memoir at the age of 88. Heidi was inspired by her mom's work and the mythology of Iceland. And I have lots of questions about that. After publishing two children's books in a collection of folklore, she co-authored an Icelandic cookbook with her mom and in 2018 published a novel. In 2019, she completed a work posthumously for her mom and wrote a motivational book called On With The Butter, <laughs> based on the life philosophies she learned from her mom. Heidi currently lives in South Dakota, but snowboards south in the winter to Arizona. In addition to her writing, she loves Scandinavian festivals, cooking, photography, travel, and exploring the outdoors. Heidi shares with us today why it is important to keep moving, keep doing, and besides, perfect for me as a German, <laughs> everything's better with butter. Plus, what we do is when we retire, and retirement is not only for old people, as we will find out. Welcome to the show, Heidi. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with you. I think it's so cute. We have a Heidi and a Heike. Yes. Because <laughs> sometimes people call me Heidi and I'm just like, no, no, um, probably not. <laughs> close, close, but not quite there, no. <laughs> As as Mark Twain used to say, that's the difference between lightning and lightning bugs. Right? I mean, yeah. totally different. Same cuteness, though. Yes. <laughs> Heidi, what do you like to do when you're outdoors? What's your favorite outdoors activity? Uh, um, I... I honestly, I just love being outside. Probably if I see a trail, I don't care whether it's a tough hike or an easy hike or paved or through the trees or I, I love to just see where the path goes and just enjoy nature and meander through. And if there's a little chair, a seat or a bench, so much the better. <laughs> I love the outdoors as well. And and uh, I love to, like, you like to hike, and we're trail runners, so outdoors for me is definitely the place to be. Mm -hmm. Now, tell our listeners, what kind of a kid when you were growing up? Who is this Heidi <laughs> writing books and novels and is very close to her mom? <laughs> I was definitely a bookworm. Definitely. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I was a volunteer librarian. I wrote, uh, read hundreds of books as a kid. And I think that was just so cool for me to open up that the world of adventure and to become aware of the world as far as, you know, reading fiction and nonfiction. I just love the idea of visiting the Azores and you know the great barrier reef and you know reading about these places as a kid it kind of instills that sense of adventure when i get big i'm gonna go there i'm gonna see that and i think it just it's world building it is did you, all those books that you read about become reality did you visit all those places oh i have a lot more places left to visit <laughs> i visited quite a few here in the united states but internationally so far i've only gone as far as canada mexico and iceland you know so i have i have many many international trips left to do yeah I mean, right now, we're, as we're recording this, we're in the middle of COVID, so we're hoping soon. It's been a year now since we've all been laid low and stationed wherever we live in the world. And we're hoping that hopefully within the next half year or so that there's less or fewer travel restrictions. Yes. And we get to all those places. But mm -hmm. tell me about your relationship with your mom. So when you think back in your early days, what was it like between you and her? Well, I, I'm actually the youngest of 10, so I am her last one. I was her baby, and yeah, and I have a sister who's uh, just over a year older than me. So by the time we were growing up, it was kind of just the two of us with mom and dad left in the house. Everybody else had, had kind of graduated high school and moved on with their life. So it was my, my sister and I that had a lot of time to adventure with mom. And she would take us to um, the Shakespeare Festival in the park 
we went to uh, music, whether it was um, orchestra or strings, and we would go on these adventures to um, old uh, cemeteries and, you know, do rubbings and kind of look at the different back then the pandemics that came through and how different families were wiped out and we would kind of learn about wow okay this lady lost her husband and two children but oh look over here she got remarried and and you could tell the story of someone's life by looking at how they were buried and you know have a little idea there um other times we would say oh what are we doing today uh, let's go look at open houses. Let's just go look and see what, what people are building. Or I remember there was once we were, we were in Tawanda, Illinois, where we grew up. Uh, and Peoria, Illinois is about a 45 minute drive away. And I remember it was a Saturday where we said, oh, what should we do today? And mom's like, you know, there's that scenic drive over in Peoria. Let's drive over to Peoria and go see that scenic drive. Oh, yay. So we hop in the car and we go over there. And it's it's on the, uh, I think it's on the north side of town, uh, right near the, um, the mall. And so we get up there and turn on where it says scenic drive. Cool. And we're driving about four blocks and it dead ends and apparently it was just a random street named scenic drive <laughs> it was not actually a scenic drive but you know once you get over there it's like oh okay what that what is there to do in town and so basically all these different types of things i kind of learned at a young age is everything out there can be explored and sometimes you deliberately plan something and it doesn't quite work out the way you planned. But as long as you're there, okay, shift gears and do something that there is available. So yeah, I think from the time I was a little kid, learning from mom, just be open to the world. And uh, she used to say, whatever there is to do, do that thing. Like that. Now, did you pack all 10 of you in a car or how did that work? Oh, no, no, no. My my oldest sister is 22 years older than me. Oh, big age gap. Yeah, she was. So my oldest sister was married and actually had four children before I was born. <laughs> so, so, yeah, but by the time I was um, probably nine it was just my sister and I left in the house. Everybody else had graduated high school and gone on to college or married or, you know, started their life. So, yeah. Uh, okay, because I was picturing like the great bunch <laughs> plus all like squeezing in the car and off to go for an adventure. <laughs> I The, the uh, older siblings, I would say yes, because the we, we called it the first family. You know, many many couples when they have that large of a family they tend to have almost like many families so they had five that each one of them are spaced about you know 12 to 18 months apart so they had five and then there's an age gap and then they had three and there's an age gap and then they had the last two so the first five kind of had that brady bunch vibe going on i think <laughs> now with all that where's dad in all of this uh, he was um, a general contractor, he was a pastor of a church, um, always studying, traveling, working. Um, so he joined some of the adventures, uh, but from the sidelines. I recall when, when we did all get together on her 70th birthday, we had a big family reunion and we were in Colorado and we decided we all wanted to go whitewater rafting. Now, of course, all all of mom's children were raised to say, hey, that sounds like fun. Let's go do that. <laughs> so, so whitewater rafting wasn't much of a stretch for any of us. Uh, and mom's in the boat, too. And so we're, we're rafting down the upper Animus in Colorado. And my father's in a car. And he studied the route and he had the map and he would drive ahead of us and park. And as we came down, we could see him standing up on the cliffs and would wave to him and then he'd hop in the car and go down the road to the next one. So he was there, but not 
quite as adventurous as what she was um as he got older now when he was young oh we have a fabulous picture of him water skiing in a three-piece suit so he had it <laughs> That's cute. Because you talk so much about your mom. So I was really curious mm -hmm. about where's dad in all of this. And of course, you need somebody at the end of the rafting trip that puts everybody back in the car and drives to where everybody's going. Mm -hmm. And and I would I would say that it it the way it all came together was that uh, once I left the house and I got married and started my work career, uh, mom and dad did a lot of adventuring together. Um, I can't tell a lot of their stories because I wasn't there, but once I moved back to central Illinois when my father was ill, um, when he passed away in 2015, mom came to live with me. And that's when we really started doing a lot of adventuring and traveling and, and I was able to document a lot of those stories. Um, when she turned 93, that's when she decided that she wanted to try a little harder to motivate people. Um, when she was 88, she wrote her book. She went uh, paragliding for the first time. At 90, she ziplined the Mall of America. And we were doing a lot of traveling, a lot of festivals. And more and more often, people would say, oh, my goodness, you're 89 years old. You're 90. You're 92 and doing all this stuff. And she had a stroke at the age of 92 and recovered from that very quickly. It just constantly people were asking this, how do you do it? And she's like, okay, fine. You know what? I am going to prove to you once and for all, you're never too old to enjoy life. You're never too old for something new. So at 93, uh, she wanted to do 93 new activities before she turned 94. I think now, it's a great goal. <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful because, I mean, think about it. Even, you know, whatever age your listener might be right now sitting there listening to this saying, okay, I personally am, I'm 52 in a week. Um, whether you're 50, I'm sorry, I'll be 53 in a week. 53, 55, 65, 70, maybe you're 30. Mm -hmm. How, whatever your age is, Think about doing a, an undertaking for a year to do that many new things. Can you even make that list? You know, do you have things that are achievable? I mean, everybody wants to, you know, maybe climb the pyramids or you know, whatever it might be, but achievable yeah. new things. Yeah, I think most people don't think about the small things that could be an adventure in itself and and always, like you said, you know, go the pyramids or do something fabulous and, and exotic. But there's so many things in in the in our everyday life and one of my past guests has talked about walking out the door and taking a different route every day to the same destination and what she found on those destinations that she took just walking down a different street that she's never walked mm -hmm. down and that inspired me to walk different routes in my neighborhood because i was like i never been down this one street so i the one day i just did that i'm like oh how cute. I didn't know that that was here. So mm -hmm. like you said, it's not big things that that we necessarily look need to look for. And some people can't afford big things that are um, quite, uh, require a lot of expenses. But let me ask you, what prompted you to retire, Heidi? When I first started in the workforce, it was always my goal. I wanted to retire at 48. I mean, that was just, that's just something I wanted to do. And it became even more important to me when I lived in North Carolina. Um, I, I lived very near Camp Lejeune down there, well, the Marine Corps base. And I had so many friends who were military and I was really surprised and saddened and, uh, Eh, not quite shocked, but how many people were afraid of retirement? How many military? Because they looked at it as I have to retire from the military and start another career. I can't stay in the military long enough, like 25, 30 years. I'll be too young. I can't retire because I'll get bored. 
wow, okay. Um, I found that sad um, because when I look at it, I was very excited about reaching that, you know, working hard and putting money away and sacrificing. It's like, I don't need a new car every year. I'm perfectly fine to drive a five-year-old car. Um, and when you look at, I can go out to eat twice a month because I really wanted to put the money into investment and savings for retirement. And I was very excited because I knew oh, once I retire, I can, we just, my, my, my magic list here, I wanted to learn Icelandic. And that, you know, it takes some focus. I, I wanted to be able to, you know, spend some real time in doing that. I wanted to write books, but I wanted to travel a little bit. And when I think of travel, going to every national park in the United States, to me, that's traveling. You know? that <laughs> um, you, did you learn Icelandic? I, I am still learning. I, I have Zoom classes twice a week with an instructor. So Can you say something Icelandic? I've never met some, I, I'm still on my list of places to go. <laughs> what does Icelandic sound like? Yegtala uh, smal Island school. Yegtala in school, smal spine school. Um, yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> I I said I speak a little Icelandic, I speak English and a little Spanish. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. Uh, say your mom's name because I, I could never, I didn't even put it in the intro because I couldn't. <laughs> what was her name? Ida Jonasdottir. See, there you have it, yeah. people. Ida Jonasdottir. Yes. <laughs> yes. And when, when you break it down, Icelandic is a fascinating language because it's a lot of compound words. Um, their last names, they're, they're a patronym society, which means the father's first name becomes the child's last name. So you're identified by who your father is. So my mother's father was Jonas, oh. J-O-N-A-S. So she was the daughter, D-O-T-T-I-R, the daughter of Jonas, so Jonas' daughter. And her brothers were, uh, their last name was Jonasson. Because they were all the sons of Jonas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. It's almost like Spanish and Spanish. They do that too, that they add the last name from God knows who. <laughs> they're like three, four uh, names at the end. How interesting. Well, thanks for teaching us a little Icelandic here. Because I was like, this is cute. This is one of my questions. I want to know. Yes. Yes. And a, a tiny bit of trivia. The word Vík in Icelandic means harbor. And the capital city, Reykjavik, Reykjavik, Reykjavik uh, Reyka is smoke. So when the Vikings came up and they saw that little bit of haze coming up, it was it was not a volcano. As, as the story goes, it was most likely the hot springs and some of the gases rising there. But they named it Smoke Harbor. So that's what Reykjavik means. Oh, hey, yeah. Mary, <laughs> I love having interviews with guests like you that are like teaching me things. Yeah. This is cool. So you're so immersed in this Icelandic culture. You know so much. We could go so many different directions, but I want to focus on you and your connection and, and then ultimately on on with the butter. But you created a lot of children's books and I'm getting to one of those at the very end, but you're you're saying that your uh, content is motivational content with women's fiction with strong characters. Yes. Speak a little bit yes. more about that. When I first started writing, it was really inspired by my mom's memoir. Uh, she wrote a childhood memoir on what it was like growing up in Iceland in 1935. Um, she met my father during World War II at a USO dance. Very romantic. Yeah. Um, so when, when she wrote her memoir, she talks a lot about the hidden people and the trolls of Christmas. They don't have Santa Claus and uh, the monster worm. And I just thought some of these stories were fascinating. So I wrote a, a children's book on the trolls of Christmas uh, to introduce those to American children. And then I started researching the folklore and I was fascinated about how folklore really um, 
shapes the culture and how it teaches certain standards and outlooks and philosophies to children. And if we think about that, you know, like um, some of the European uh, fairy tales that we tell here in the United States, um, whether it's the princess in the pea or uh, Cinderella or um, Snow White, in, in a lot of these, the princess is always beautiful and she's good. The prince is handsome and he's good. The witch, if she's ugly, she's bad. If she's beautiful, then she's probably a fairy, so she's good. And dragons are the enemy and they must be killed to keep everyone safe. And that is kind of like the, the core basis of how we start interacting with culture and society and with others. What I loved about the Icelandic uh, folklore when I started looking into it is um, they have stories that protect the land. You know, if if you harm the land, the hidden will punish you and your crops will fail or your house will fall down and, you know, these crazy things will happen. But there's a wonderful folklore about um, trolls that kind of attack humans. And then when the priest comes to try to exercise them and throw holy water at them, the trolls beg for mercy and say, you know, even the wicked need a place to be. So their priest decides that three quarters of this cliff are for humans, but one quarter, humans don't go there because the trolls need a place to live. And it just kind of has this idea of coexistence and being nice to each other and taking care of the land and working hard. And you can probably interpret different folklore in different ways, depending on what you're looking for. But that's what I saw. And when you look at some of the Scandinavian and the difference between um, uh, the ones from Denmark and Norway, you really see that common theme, like the ugly duckling. Um, they're different folklore and the message is different. So I, I just love that and kind of went off on a tangent there. Uh, but then when it came time to say, you know, what do I really, really want to write? And I started on women's fiction. I started incorporating some of the Icelandic into the storyline. And when I wanted a character to go back in history and have this memory of World War II, I used one of my mom's own memories and I used uh, a story she told me about the first time she met my dad. And I sort of implanted that in the story and made that the character's backstory and just kind of add that. That's wonderful. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I was raised in Germany and our folklore in Germany is usually when I tell stories, People are like, this is really brutal. This is, you know, you're like always killing people off or uh, it's very dark. And and I, I'm trying to think of Hensel and Gretel. I don't know how you can translate this where the witch burns the, or tries to burn the two kids and stars them mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But the messages are always very different than what we hear in the U.S. And you're very right about, oh, there's the nice people are good people. The ugly people are the bad people and and. So so-and-so has to be killed for that reason, to better the good person. Uh, but in other cultures, and from what I'm hearing as well, Icelandic in Denmark, I have a good friend who is from Denmark. The, the stories are very different, have a very different um, interpretation or meaning to, to like you said, the, we want to protect the land. You know, it's not, not all trolls are bad. Um, you know, or they're, they're whatever they are. So I, I love that idea because I think more now more than ever, we need to be aware of our environment. We need to do more. We need to be kinder to each other. We need to lift each other up and not tear mm -hmm. each other down and support women, strong women that can lift other women up to become just as strong if they don't have the confidence to do that yet. And I think that's that's sort of so to me, at least from what you said, sounds very reflective of that. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely try um, the women's fiction that I'm working on now. I have a, a new series that each one of the books is is really strongly focused on that 
uh, interpersonal relationship between friends, the emotional responses to challenges, and I'm working with characters in the 50 to 60 year old changing life perspective and how you deal with that. So kind of focusing on that, it's, it's important to me because like you say, just holding each other up and giving each other more resources and different ways to look at things and different tools to overcome challenges. I just think that's so important. Yeah. And then, and then with that, uh, I pull it back to the on with the butter because <laughs> I'm holding on with the butter here in my hands, people. You can't see it unless you watch the video and you have a chance. And I will talk about it at the end to get one of those books from Heidi, but so we're going back to the butter, the title, yes. the, <laughs> and it doesn't only go on your head. That's a different fitness thing. But uh, so when you say, okay, on with the butter, give us what on with the butter is and tell us a little bit more about it. Well, it was, it was inspired again by my mom. And she used to say that uh, the way to stay young was to just keep moving. That was her big mantra, just keep moving, just keep moving. And there's an expression in Icelandic that is afram med smurthed, and it literally translates to on with the butter. And it's it's like a uh, an encouragement, like uh, get the lead out or get a move on. And it, it means to, to forge ahead or just keep moving or uh, continue on. And that was really the perfect title for this book because that's what it's all about. Some people have this innate ability to find things to do and they're active and they have such motivation. And other people are like, well, I need a little help. I don't know quite what to do. So I wanted to tell some motivational stories from my life, from my mom's life. And then in each chapter, I give a lot of examples on things that you can do relating to a particular topic. And then at the end of every chapter, I did 10 to 12 challenges. So it's like, go out and do this, you know, get involved. And hopefully if you read the through the whole book, there's over 200 individual ideas on things to do and how to increase activity. Um, but it's definitely my fondest wish that people would use this as a starting point to get the wheels turning and then to come up with another 500 things to do on their own. Do you think that, I mean, and you've heard this about your mom and you, you really are a reflection of your mom of, as far as adventure is concerned. Thank you. <laughs> it's that people are just afraid of what might happen if they actually do something new. I, I, I find that to be very interesting because sometimes I, I think you're right. People are afraid of what's new and it, if you go back in in your memory we we've done that through each of us through our whole lives your first day of school the first day of junior high the first day that you, you moved to a new town the first time you joined a a fitness club you know whether it's something that you did on your own or with somebody else, even if it's you and your best friend going off to summer camp or going off to college, mm -hmm. every new thing you do, it's scary to think about. But by the same token, if you look back on those same scary memories, think about how it opened up your world and how it expanded your thought process. And you, you come across things that you didn't even know that you didn't know. And again, that's part of what makes us more empathetic and sympathetic and more understanding to other people, other cultures, and even, you know, wow, how can somebody possibly think that hobby's interesting? Who in the who in their right mind would go bird watching for three hours a day? Well, <laughs> if you if you don't know, you don't know. I it can be fascinating. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, I went bird watching once. <laughs> Everybody like looking at, and I was like, I don't see anything. I wonder what they're all seeing. I've I've had a few of those in in my own life. It's like 
You want me to do what? Oh, goodness. I hope we go out to eat somewhere really great afterwards so I at least can salvage something out of this experience. And sometimes that is the high point is when you're done, you get to go out and socialize. And, you know, but other times you find that, wow, I really like the symphony orchestra. I had no idea. Or... Uh, I, I know I've, I've drugged my husband to more than one dinner theater, and he doesn't hate them. <laughs> it's, and I was like, you know, I agree with you. It's like I'm also all about new experiences. And, and sometimes you don't have anybody to do them with. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody who's like, you know, I'm here, I'm retired, I don't have kids, uh, I'm divorced. Here I'm sitting here by myself in my little apartment and I'm okay, let's use knitting. Please, all knitters, don't hate me. And I'm knitting socks all day. And mm -hmm. I can't think of anything to do, but I am so afraid to go out by myself. What would you tell somebody like that? Well, that that's already a starting point. And and to, to that person, I'm I'm gonna give you five different ideas. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, notes. <laughs> notes. Um, if there's somewhere that you've always liked to go, like um, maybe uh, botanical gardens or the zoo or somewhere like that, make a point to go because even if you're alone, you're enjoying the natural environment and it's perfectly acceptable to do that alone. Um, number two, you can join a community group because you know joining uh, maybe a dance class or maybe um, you know post covid uh you know maybe the community theater and if you're not interested in being an actor or something like that volunteer to be a ticket taker or something at the very least you're going to meet other people and, and find more people to do stuff with uh you can go out to a farmer's market get some fresh air pick some new foods, come home, bake up something new, and then maybe share it with a neighbor or take it to your church or community center and share whatever you made with other people. Or go on Facebook and share the recipe and photos and, and connect up with some people there. If you like your knitting, what are you doing with your knitting? Okay, how about joining um, an organization to uh donate those or help give away socks or or beanies or you know maybe set up a little etsy store and start selling them and have a little booth at the farmer's market that'll kind of get you out and going and at the very very least go out and take a walk because i find that when i run in my neighborhood at the same time usually on the days i run you always run into the same people and at first Everybody is kind of, especially now with the masks on, they're kind of glancing over their masks and they just keep walking. By now, we go in the same route, then it's like a wave. So it's like, oh, I know that one. Okay. <laughs> and then now we're we're up to like a good morning. So we, we've worked our way up through, through the, the run and just seeing somebody consistently too. And, and that I think really helps too, because there are a lot of people and now Again, I go back to COVID. We have so many people that are depressed and that are alone, younger, much younger group than we're talking to here at the Pursue Your Spark podcast. Uh, not, we're not talking only old people. And that's why I said, you know, or mm -hmm. older. I mean, I'm going to be, okay, I'm going to be 60 Heidi in April. So <laughs> I'm now a young chicken. <laughs> and, but it's so young. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, I'm rocking it. I was like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's like when we think retirement, we're thinking, oh, over 80. That's like the age group, it seems right now, to be the people that qualify to retire. Um, but speaking about loneliness, it's not only the older people that are lonely. Right now, all the younger people that are so lonely and depressed, and they need this, they need this episode just like anybody our age or older with, mm -hmm. with your book of getting ideas and just getting unstuck. Yes. To, yes. To not sit there and just watch binge watch Netflix one after the other or sit there and, and Instagram for hours or TikTok for days. Um, but to, to actually, like you said, you know, at least go for a walk, go outside, mm -hmm. get some fresh air, let the sun shine in your face and see what happens. 
Exactly. And and that that's what I, I tried to accomplish with this book is to separate it into different chapters. I have one chapter that's just about food and all the activities that you can actually build around food. Like I said, going to the farmer's market and picking out uh, a new vegetable or a favorite vegetable. And then you know, interacting on Facebook or calling people. Call your friends. Talk to them on the phone. Hey, I have a kohlrabi. What should I do with it? <laughs> very un-American un vegetable. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I've... Uh, yeah, I've, I've had some different experimentation. More recently, we had a, a friend who was not able to make it down from Canada here to Arizona this year because of travel restrictions. And so his poor fruit trees are just rotting and dropping. And so he's begging people to go over to his house and pick grapefruits and uh, lemons and, and all this. So we went over there and I ended up with like two bushels of grapefruit. I had no idea what to do with grapefruit, but boy, I have gone through the gambit of recipes now. <laughs> this, this also, with what you said about the food, I have the one I want to want to know more about is walk on the wild side. That's, that's a <laughs> song. Take a walk on the wild. Side. <laughs> I and and I think. Is that one that I had? Oh, Be Bold. Be Bold has, has a, a quote that I had marked that I wanted to share. But walking on the wild side, one fun thing, I, I got to flip through my copy of the book. Um, and, and I will share this. Walking on the wild side really has to do with um, getting outside your comfort zone and maybe trying something that you previously would have shied away from a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to read you one quick paragraph from here. Throughout our lives, we learn from experience, adding knowledge and personal opinions to our understanding of the world, what we like, what we fear, what tastes good, what we think is beautiful. At any point, who we are as a person and how we think is this based on the sum total of our experiences. And as long as we're alive, we can keep adding to that total. We can have new experiences that affect our understanding and attitude. So it stands to reason that the more diverse the experiences are, the greater the sum total of our life will be. We're never going to know how much we're truly capable of until we step out of our comfort zone. Amen to that. And so that's really what it's what it's all about. And for some people, that might be, like I said, you know, joining a local theater group. I'm terrified to get on stage. I don't want to do that. And being able to take those first baby steps and maybe start out as an usher or a ticket taker or working on the scenes or working on lighting. And maybe after a couple of seasons, maybe you'll be good getting a bit part because you'll be surrounded by friends at that point, right? Very true. Very true. Yeah. So we can take that in, in every aspect of our life. And uh, let's see, I think my challenge list in that chapter, let's see. Um, and this is one where it can be doing something by yourself. One of my challenges, go to a movie or dinner by yourself. Be okay with who you are. Enter a contest, poetry writing, baking, pie making, whatever. Attend a masquerade party or a costume party in the most unlikely costume that you can think of. Whatever is like completely opposite of your personality that would really surprise everyone. Go as that because it's fun and it gets you out of your comfort zone. How about toboggan down a ski slope? Oh, I'm all about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Join a challenge like a three-legged race or a juggling contest. Attend something you'd always assume that you'd dislike, like the ballet, maybe an escape room, or an educational seminar. Something you think you'll hate. Go do it anyway. You know, I found that when I grew up, my parents uh, thought of classical music as, as noise. And wow. they were like, this is really awful. We're not listening to this crap. What is all this? 
And so I never really was exposed to classical music other than you hear your normal uh, Haydn or whatever, Mozart, and you knew the, 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 the ones that everybody plays on any commercial, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, yeah, I know this song. That's from the elevator. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Until I uh, met my, my now husband, uh, and he is a fan of anything classical. And so our first date was to the Kennedy Center here in Washington, D.C., to a beautiful uh, concert by the National Symphony, and they played Haydn. And oh. I sat there and I started crying because it was so beautiful. <laughs> it was so beautiful, yes. <laughs> and I had no idea. And I was thinking, should I go on a date with this guy? I don't know, classical music. My parents always said, this is, this is not so great. Rock and roll is much better. And I, you know, I never took it up on myself to explore it on my own, which I was like, I could have done that. Why did I never do that? Yeah whatever it just didn't happen and now it happened and we frequently go to concerts when things are open or we now stream it in our living room comfortably in our couch and he's on his couch i'm on my couch and we're like okay are we going to do american <laughs> theater today or what <laughs> so uh <-huh. laughs> i am all about something that you think you may not like that's, uh -huh. that's really something where you go what actually i do like this that's kind of cool yeah yeah, absolutely. Now, which brings from the wild side, we're moving into the playful side. Now, that's my final playful. <laughs> Then I have the, something else. The playful side. So what would be a playful thing? Uh, at one, of, one of the great examples from my mom. Now, me personally, I, I do all kinds of playful things. Uh, my mom would go with uh, the, the kids into a pit ball playroom. You know, it's it's okay to do that. When you go to the park, it's okay to play on the swings or the teeter-totter. Um, but as we get older, playtime can actually be so many other things. It might be actual games, board games, uh, card games. Um, I had so much fun with my mom when we had a hoverboard here. We put it, you know, with the seat on it, of course, so it ended up being like a little go-kart. And she's zipping around here and that, uh, just taking a drive in the desert in the four-wheeler. That can be plain, especially if you stop and collect rocks or, you know, what each one of us has something different. And we need to be careful not to try to put a box around things. I, I recently finally figured out something about myself, which was like a huge revelation. And now when I look back, I'm going like, well, that was really kind of stupid. I don't know why that wasn't obvious to me sooner. <laughs> My husband is a big fan of chess and um, like backgammon and, you know, these really challenging focus games. He loves to play poker. And I struggle with playing chess. Uh, I, I don't have the strategy for it. And... I, I just, I can't get into all the moves and the intricacies and that, and a lot of these games where you're moving the pegs and you're counting and, and having to follow all that. Me, I love it when the ladies want to get together and play bunko. I like to play apples to apples. I like to have, you know, set up the, the Wii and, and get out the, um, the, the games in the Wii. And I realized that my husband is very analytical. He's incredibly smart in math and he loves the mental challenge and the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the, just that, that focus. And me, I don't enjoy a game if I can't talk and laugh and cut up and, and snack and have my wine. And if, if it's a game where I need to be focused and quiet, <laughs> I don't find that fun. <laughs> It is I'm looking at that one. My husband is the same. I, I don't have the logic to actually remember what the heck I just did and why I did this on a chessboard. And even you may have seen the movie The Queen's Gambit. Yes. And that was really great. And I'm like, afterwards, I totally will understand those moves. <laughs> no, nope, I love the story, but I'm like, no, that definitely doesn't tick with me in my brain. Mm -hmm. I, I downloaded an app on my phone so I can play chess against a computer. I still don't get it. 
I, I still don't find it fun. Um, but I, I play trivia, I play word games, I like Boggle. You know, some of those I, I'm more letters than numbers, but anything where I can interact and cut up and have fun and I don't have to have the challenge of winning, to me that's fun. And other people like that challenge of I want to compete and I want to win. And that's great. That's more fun because some of these silly games, someone who likes the challenge, they're going to find that too silly and that's not going to be fun. So we need to understand our own personalities and say, what is fun? You know, yeah. other people might like painting or coloring books and that's fun because it's a time where they can de-stress and their mind's not going and just the fact that they're relaxed is fun so yeah understanding what fun means to you and then charge for it go do it what would you say in closing uh, to our <laughs> listeners of what you would encourage them to do after listening to this podcast Oh my goodness, everything. Go, I encourage you. <laughs> yes, go get the book and just read through it. Uh, definitely make sure you spend time outside. I've, I've got a lot of scientific references in the book on why all this stuff is really good for your brain and good for your body. So definitely read the book so you understand the science behind why all this is good stuff for you. But go outside, have fun, and don't let a pandemic keep you from living. Because just like when we get old, if you got a bum knee, that doesn't stop you from doing things. You just do things in a different way. Look at this pandemic the same way. Fine, there might be stuff that you can't do in the way that you used to do it, but that doesn't mean you can't do stuff. Just do it safe. <laughs> Very true. And that's what I keep preaching to. It's like, you're not too old to do anything. I mean, your mom yeah. is the perfect example. At 93, zipping around, doing all kinds of stuff, being ziplining at 88, and then doing all these adventures. It's like, don't let a, a, a disability or a aching back, anything like that hold you back to live your dreams, mm -hmm. to, to be vibrant, and to be outgoing, and to To feel, you know, don't think now I'm retired. Uh, I can't have any butter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Spread that butter on your life. <laughs> it may be a metaphor, but you know, just just go do it. Embrace it. And you woke up this morning. You're breathing. Live today. Yep. Heidi, what would you? Um, I uh, wish other interviewers have asked you that interviewed you in the past because you've been inter interviewed by many <laughs> other people. And I was, especially when somebody like you was very well known, has written several books, people want to know all this stuff about it. And they always <laughs> ask the pretty much the same questions. <laughs> and, but what would be one thing you said, why don't they ever ask me that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, that's an unexpected question. Um, Well, I honestly, for me, I am such a talker and no matter what you ask me, I probably spin in some, you know, <laughs> strange direction anyway. Um, but I, I think what it comes down to is, is really this message of on with the butter and, you know, why it's important. And I don't know, as far as asking me sort of like what's, Well, every question that keeps popping in my head, I'm going like, nope, that's been asked before. No. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure I can come up with a question for you. <laughs> that's, that's no problem. I was like, I'm just curious. And I had some guests that I asked a question and they were like, I wish they would ask me this. But if you don't have anything that, and everybody does a really great job asking you all kinds of things. Now, yeah. My final question is, where can people buy your book or books? And since we're talking about specifically on the butter, I want to say before Heidi says what she has to say is that if you leave a review on the Apple podcast at Pursue Your Spark, you can have one copy. We have two copies. So got a hustle, man, uh, to get a copy of Heidi's book in your inbox. But if you're not the lucky winner and you didn't act soon enough with a review, Where can people get your book, Heidi? 
my book is available at all major retailers. You can get it from Apple or Barnes and Noble or Amazon if you like the ebook format. Um, it may be in stock at your local Barnes and Noble store. If not, you you would need to ask for it. Uh, it's also available on my website. Uh, Heidi Herman author.com and if you follow the link through the website and order it from uh, the publishing company you can get an autograph copy so uh, there you go and where can people reach you on social media and connect with you Heidi Herman author uh, is on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram uh, are the three platforms that I am most active on yeah, I checked that out before the interview. I'm like, oh, I love when it's easy. It's, it's right when people go, oh, I'm Heidi H here. I'm I'm H Herman there. I was like, no, this is easy. So people can find you. Um, so thank you so much for being here, helping us spread on the butter on our life. Yes. It was a pleasure talking to you, Heidi. And a pleasure talking with you as well. And oh, I forgot one last little thing. If you connect with me through Facebook, you can follow that link to the On With The Butter group on Facebook so you can share your adventures with everyone else and let's help motivate everybody to stay active and have fun. This is fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. And Thank you. Guys, we have all the links in the show notes, so do not worry. You can just tap and click and get to wherever we talked about today and get your free copy, or, but you have to leave the review on the podcast, on the Apple podcast. But I also want to hear from you because I will spread this message on all social media, and you can find me at Heike Yates on Instagram, Heike Yates, Pursue Your Spark on Facebook, and everywhere else under Heike Yates. And we do want to hear... What was your first adventure that you took that was out of the norm, maybe out of the book? So let us know. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> no, we don't want to go there. Hold on. We want